beyond the peak experience. Listen in to the lineage. Multiple messages. Hello and welcome to the Entheo Show. Coming up from the bottom of the ground of Washington. Please welcome your hosts, Michael File, Colin McDougall, and Ann Bannister. Howdy, everybody. Uh, welcome to Entheo Show, episode 10. We're really excited. Uh, we've got we've got some fantastic guests today. Um, we've got some news for you. We're going to get a little bit into some uh, current events uh, within the movement, uh, talking about peyote. Um, so I guess let's uh, just hop to it. Uh, last show was Jeff Irwin and Kat Ebert. Uh, Kat Ebert is on the board of directors for SSDP, also with uh, Decrim Mid Michigan, who is doing a kind of hybrid of a Decrim All along with protecting the grow gather gift model and accessibility within the naturally occurring plants. Um, so that's really exciting to see uh, a little bit of expansion there. And that was a great conversation. The Jeff Irwin discussion that that was just fantastic. The whole show, uh, every episode gets a little bit better. Um, so uh, Thank you, I'm really grateful Thank you. for Jim and Colin for, uh, you know, and all for uh, helping make this possible and really excited for our next 10 after this. So, uh, Jim, what do you got for us for news? Uh, uh, news. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, I just wanted to say today we have a great show and uh, we have two guests. Um, yes. Yeah. Sincere Seven from the Detroit Psychonaut Academy. Did I say it right? Psychonaut Academy of Detroit. Psychonaut Academy of Detroit. Pat. And and uh, Saeed Murtaza from uh, uh, Decrim Nature ha uh, Mad Madison Park, Madison Heights. So there's a Hazel Park, Madison Park, Madison Heights. <laughs> They're all little cities next to each other right above Detroit. So, um, but uh, if you want to get to the news first, um, but I just wanted to remind everybody or tell everyone what today's show is all about. Should be a good show. Um, it already is. Hey, so uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, an affiliate of the Harvard Medical School, launched a new center to study the clinical benefits of psychedelics in treating mental illness. The Center of the Neuroscience of Psychedelics comes amid a statewide push for psych psychedelic decriminalization, including acts passed in Cambridge and Somerville. Those are our people out there that we love so much have been on the show here. Uh, it specifically cite the possible medical benefits of substances like psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms. Um, another news uh, article out in the, recently was, could there be mushrooms on Mars? In a new paper, an international team of scientists from countries including US, France, and China, Gathered and compared photographic evidence they claim show fungus like objects growing on the red planet. Which um, I gotta tell you, the so, pictures I saw look like it. And Mike, can you expand? Like, I know that you were online doing some uh, research on this too. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> I, I would love to expand on this. Uh, as an aspiring astromycologist uh, and longtime. Karen, my colleagist. Uh, I, I find this really interesting. Uh, the photos certainly have all the macroscopic aspects uh, of a small puffball mushroom or maybe some sort of like slime mold uh, forming. However, if you share this on Facebook, what will happen is Facebook's going to put one of those big alert fake news things over your article that has to be clicked through to get there. The reason for that is uh, there was a major rebuttal that came out. When I shared it, I shared both sides of the story. Not everybody is doing that. And it's really easy to get sensationalized about these things. This is speculation that these look like mushrooms. There is a mycologist on the team that is making that statement. Um, 
they are there are scientists on this team besides the mycologists that are also supporting this but there are also people that are saying absolutely not there's no way um i think what's really important here though is it's not fake news it, it was an opinion it says it looks like it seems like nobody said it is and so you know push back against zuckerberg for that one uh if you get a chance but uh as an aspiring astromycologist, it is interesting to note things such as lichens or fungal spores can survive the vacuum of space. They do not grow, but they go dormant. And then upon reintroduction to a viable environment, go right back to life. So this is part of the reason why I'm very interested in space exploration moving forward, because if we are going to talk about terraforming other planets, we are going to need fungus as part of that to help create an atmosphere. And I want to be at the front end of that. So uh, hopefully in the coming few years, you'll hear a lot more from me on this. Uh, I, I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole, but I won't stop tweeting at Elon Musk about it. So uh, I, I'm going to Mars. Uh, I'm going to eat Mike mushrooms on Mars. Mark my word. Um, they, but but before we dive down that rabbit hole too far, uh, it, is there anything else on that or do we have more news? I got one more little uh piece of news researchers um have identified a psychedelic that doesn't trigger hallucinations a key discovery that could allow scientists to accelerate the development of easy to use treatments for mental health and neurological conditions that just doesn't it sounds really if it's a psychedelic and it doesn't trigger hallucinations i don't understand how it's a psychedelic isn't psychedelic give you some sort of hallucinogenic I I, I might be able to shed a little light on that. I when you first said that headline, I was a little like scratching my head. But uh, if you look back to the 40s, the 50s, uh, even the 30s, uh, early mescaline research, uh, the term hallucinogenic or hallucinogen was heavily thrown around when we're talking about LSD mushrooms as they came out. Uh, Later into, I believe it was the late 50s, that was kind of set aside because a hallucination implies something that isn't there. But people were having beneficial experiences that lasted beyond that. So we moved to the language of psychedelic. Psyche, meaning of the mind, delic, to manifest. So mind manifesting. Um, and so... The idea of a non-hallucinogenic, something that doesn't make you see stuff, hear stuff, feel things that aren't physically there to everybody else in three-dimensional reality, uh, while still having a mind manifesting experience, I can kind of see, but it's a very misleading title, if you ask me. But this is why we've moved on from the term psychedelic, and we tend to use the term entheogen, meaning to awaken the divine within. Uh, and I, everybody here uh, has had that divine experience, and that's why we're here. So um, I, there are definitely psychedelic drugs that are non-divine. 2CB is fucking fantastic. But there's nothing divine about it. The world collapses into a bubble. Those bubbles bounce and split into more bubbles. And then each bubble is a different possible. There's so many possibilities going on. Uh, <laughs> there are hallucinogens. There are psychedelics. And there are entheogens. So um, I think maybe that sheds a little light. But uh, Jim, I haven't seen that article. I would love if you send that my way. Happy to. I think it's on Slack. Um, oh, well, you know my Slack's uh, slacking lately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what about um, the psychedelic I, plant of the show? What's the spotlight plant? Yeah, let's uh, let's do that before we get into this peyote discussion and our guests. Um, so. 
we've talked about psilocybin containing mushrooms in the past. Specifically, I believe we discussed psilocybe cubensis, uh, the commonly homegrown magic mushroom that everybody knows and loves. Uh, but today I wanted to kind of go back to the psilocybin containing mushrooms, but we're in Michigan. So let's talk about Michigan based psilocybin mushrooms, specifically the Gymnopilius genus. So Gymnopilius uh, luteophilus and Spectabilis both grow in the Michigan region. And what's interesting about these is uh, when we talk about psilocybin containing mushrooms, we are talking about not just psilocybin, but we call them psilocybin containing mushrooms. Just like cannabis has THC, CBD, CBG, CBN, right on down the line, mushrooms that contain these compounds don't just contain psilocybin. They also contain psilocin. They contain biocysteine, norbiocysteine, and a whole range of other active, supposedly, alkaloids. So when we're talking about psilocybin research, Almost every researcher is working with uh, either an extract or a synthetic version of psilocybin. And they're not experiencing the entourage effect that we so know and love with cannabis. And we ran into this with THC. Look at Marinol. Marinol is not very effective. It works for some people. It suppresses, you know, or it simulates appetite, suppresses nausea, but it, there's no high attached. Um, maybe it helps your glaucoma a bit, but... <laughs> Us smokers, we're in this for this full-on entourage effect. So within the Gymnopilia species, uh, I, it's interesting because most of psilocybin-containing mushrooms are really are higher percentages of psilocybin and psilocin and a low percentage of biocysteine, norbiocysteine, etc. In the Gymnopilius, that shifts. The biocysteine is the dominant alkaloid. And so people, as a common name, tend to call these big laughing gyms. I don't know if you've ever gotten into a giggle fit on mushrooms where you just can't stop laughing. It's suspected that biocysteine, norbiocysteine, and that uh, end of the spectrum is where those giggles come from. Whereas those hallucinogenic mind manifesting uh, psychedelic effects within the, uh, they tend to be more the psilocybin, psilocin. So this entourage effect of all this leads to this divine experience in my, in my personal experience but I also view the mushrooms as a conscious entity that are teaching us something. So let's throw the alkaloids even out the window for that. But I think the gymnopilius are really interesting because they do grow in Michigan. We can go out in the woods and find them in the flood plains of any major river in the lower and northern peninsula uh, after a major flood growing on dead wood. It's really important to note, though. There are poisonous lookalikes. It's a small orange mushroom. We have the jack-o'-lantern. We have a uh, uh, mycena that's orange. Um, both of those are very toxic and you should not be eating them. So as always, when you're collecting mushrooms, make sure you have an experienced guide or you know, you know how to take a good spore print. You know how to identify the macroscopic features of the mushroom. Uh, for me, the big tell is they've got a sort of purplish spore print, just like our friends, the Cubensis, versus, uh, so when you look at them from underneath, you kind of see this uh, darker gill versus the jack-o'-lanterns and the mycenas are orange gills. Um, the problem is, if they haven't sporulated yet, you're not going to see that color. So... Um, you know, I, I would advise against going and collecting unless you're out there with a pro, but, uh, you know, if uh, we're, we're opening back up, maybe we should do an entheo fest slash decrim nature uh, floodplain hunt. Like a, like a, uh, like a, 
like uh, you go out in the woods and we like just follow you like well like, no no that is not how a, for, a lead foray goes generally the person <laughs> leading the foray makes it 10 feet into the woods while everybody else runs out and keeps running back to that person because that person doesn't make it more than past the first mushroom before everybody else keeps bringing them more mushrooms so i'll probably be sitting in one spot identifying everything i won't get much hunting done i'll leave that to everybody else but not only will we hopefully find gymnopilias but you know maybe some other psychedelics such as a penalia species or uh you know, maybe something edible, chicken in the woods, maitake, or teach you about some other poisonous mushrooms. There's lots of things to do in the woods. Um, so that is our plant, or this week, fungus of the week. Um, but I want to get into this peyote discussion. Uh, Decrim Nature just put out the national group, not the Michigan group. Uh, sorry for any confusion in any way on our email list that saw that um just put out a statement and i do not have the statement in front of me i'm going to try and do this off the top of my head but essentially uh, there has been a little bit of pushback on uh the decrim nature movement for including peyote in its discussion um peyote is a sacred plant that has been revered for thousands of years by indigenous tribes throughout the southwest of mexico and is endangered. And so the idea of decriminalizing is a threat to the peyote habitat. And so groups like IPCI, which is Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, I believe, um, and then the NCAC, the National Council on Native American Churches, both have put out statements that are essentially against including peyote in these measures. However, their argument for this is conservation. And we agree. We applaud the work of IPCI and the NCNAC. However, they do not represent all Native American churches that are federally recognized. There are more Native American churches that do not feel the same way. Over, all told, there's over 500,000 Native American church members in this country alone. Now, we're not even talking about Mexico yet. Now, with its habitat being threatened by development, with years of wild harvest without growing, a plant that takes seven to 10 years to reach a size that is harvestable and you need to harvest multiple of them to consume, this is a danger to it. And so these groups have really made these statements as a conservation effort and that we applaud. And we want to join that conservation effort. We want to work with these groups and with all Native American churches and with everybody that has a sacred garden to allow the cultivation of peyote and allow the use and transfer within the Native American church. But even if you're not a member of the Native, oh, I might be freezing. Uh, you're good. You're good even now. if you're not a member of the Native American church, we believe you should be able to go as a conservation effort. Um, so uh, that's essentially what the statement was. What was that, Colin? Nothing. You're just, we can hear you, but your face is frozen. Shut off Wi-Fi on all of your devices at home, please. <laughs> He's going to probably have to restart. <laughs> um, well, it's a good thing we're still, here he comes. Well, cool. Happy 420, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can't see you, but we can hear you. To we make can it hear you with a little thumbs up. up. Oh, this is sad. <laughs> hey. Oh, you I am back. There. there you go. In there like swimwear. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah, I'm mute. 
Sorry, I, I, I muted over here and unmuted the streaming computer. Um, so where did I get cut out? Um, that we should be able to cultivate our own. Yeah. So th that's essentially the point. Um, we believe in the transfer and usage, uh, being sacred and being protected amongst uh, tribes and Native American church members. However, as a conservation effort to continue this wonderful plant's existence for many millennia to come, everybody should be allowed to cultivate in their sacred garden. And that was essentially the statement. You can find that statement on the Decrim Nature uh, National website. You can also see an open letter from the executive director, Carlos Plazola, uh, who is an indigenous member of our community uh, for some very great insight into the situation. Uh, that would lead me to Wednesday, May 26th, we will be having a discussion, a Decrim Nature Michigan community meeting where we will deep dive into this peyote issue and the history of this because this discussion has been going on over a year now. So let's, uh, let's deep dive in. And then Thursday the 27th at 9 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, there will be a clubhouse meeting for Decrim Nature national and it won't be a meeting it'll be an open discussion on this so two chances in two weeks to have this discussion to understand why we've made this statement and why we've taken this stance and to really understand that we do have the support of several Native American church and indigenous members in making this decision. This isn't just us running out, making some random decision. We've been having this discussion with leaders for several years or for over a year. And uh, yeah, so come to one of those meetings, find out more. It is now 420. Uh, I see our guest is already on point with that. So uh, I'd love to introduce Sincere Seven of the Psychonaut Academy of Detroit. I'm really excited because I don't know what we're getting into here. Uh, I, Psychonaut Academy of Detroit, I love following him on social media. So welcome to the Entheo Show. Man, thank you. I am honored. I am honored. The 10th show, up, that, is, that is always something that is uh, foundational to me for shows. You know what I mean? Like that 10th one. It's like, yeah, we, we done went through the first nine. We didn't got it down pat, and we in here doing it. So I'm honored, man, to be here. And I, I appreciate you all for giving me the ability to uh, be on your platform. Absolutely. Um, so I guess a little bit of background. What is Psychonaut Academy of Detroit? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the Psychonaut Academy of Detroit is the, the way I like to explain it is if you was to go back to the indigenous lands of Africa and you have the village, right? And then you have where you go away from the village and you go into the trees and the forest and all of these, right? And right on the border of both of those things, the village and the forest, you have the Psychonaut Academy. So we are basically what we like to term the gatekeepers for transferring from one level of um, of course, state of consciousness to another, as well as dealing with sacred healing, herbs, medicines, plants, and animals. Um, but we like to present ourselves more as an academy than anything. And like I was telling people, uh, I have no problem with the hippies. I love it, the whole idea of what happened back in the day. But what I tell people is the difference between the hippies and the psychonauts the hippies were experiencing something. The psychonauts were studying it. We're like, okay, we're, we're aware of this. Our parents were like totally in this shit. Like, you know what I mean? They were, they were, they were grasping something that they were like, y'all don't get it. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it so that we know each one, what it does, what it helps with, what it allows you to do, the proper way to utilize it, use it for healing, for traveling, for growth and development, for biohacking, whatever it is that you need to do to bring yourself to the state of growth and development that you are trying to bring yourself to. 
Wow. I, I, I actually love that description there of like, you're with the community and nature, like where this comes together because yes. Yes. Detroit is a, uh, being a Michigander, you have Michigan and, and then you have Detroit. If you live anywhere else in Michigan, all of or all of this is Detroit. To to somebody over here in Grand Rapids, you say Ann Arbor, you're like, oh, Detroit. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a huge urban landscape that it does not have. A, you know, I I just moved to the city from deep in the woods, and it, it's shocking to me. And Grand Rapids isn't anything isn't anything like Detroit. Um, and to, I, I, Kalindi was a really great example of what the Detroit psychedelic movement has to offer. And uh, I, I believe I actually met you the first time at Kalindi's conference, the Detroit Psychedelic Conference. Um, I mean, I, were you one of his students or? Yes, um, yes I uh, was a student of mycology. I trained in martial arts with them briefly and, um, you know, more than anything in my heart, we were friends, you know. Um, so, yes, I definitely uh, come from that background and teachings. That is actually who introduced me to mycology. Um, basically, I have been growing cannabis in my community for a while. And um, basically, I, I was I was one of the best ones, and so when certain people, stars, and things used to come into the city, they would call me for cannabis. So my my um, reputation for my growth habits went around because I'm a totally organic farmer. Okay, so I don't use the chemicals and all of that. So um, I was told that Bob had basically heard about my grown skills in the cannabis community. He was like, well, if he can grow that, well, you know, what do with these mushrooms? And um, he had Baba Moodoo reach out to one of my big brothers and introduced him to the mushrooms and he introduced me and it just rolled downhill from there. And I was one of the ones who, once I got a hold of it, I loved it. I, it, it was like, it helped me to, um, to adjust from PTSD, from the military. And I mean, I had been smoking cannabis as my, you know, DOC, as they say, my drug of choice for dealing with my issues, but really what it would do is I'm smoking and it allowed me to calm down for 45 an hour or whatever. But then once I'm, you know, not smoking, I'm, I'm angry again, I'm mad again. But when I went through my first trip, I went through seven grams, um, psilocybin was my first trip and it went in and it healed the anger, it healed the pain, it healed the control issues. And my, my women and children noticed the difference in me immediately, you know? And so that's when I knew this is something totally different than weed. This is, you know what I mean? Cause I didn't need to do mushrooms every day. Like, oh no, I'm doing this to, no, I only had to do it that one time to heal that, you know? And so that's when I just knew like, no, this is something bigger than, you know, a weekend or sitting at the house smoking or something. No, this is, this is changing lives. Cause it changed mine. I, absolutely. That was uh, my experience as well. Uh, everyday smoker for several years, user of several other substances, and then uh, one single psychedelic mushroom experience. I never looked back at heroin again. I never looked back at going back to smoking methamphetamines. Uh, yet, I didn't need to go back and use the mushroom the next day or the next week or even a month later. It took me six months before I even thought of doing it. And it wasn't because I needed it. It was because, man, if it, if it did this much to make me a better person and turn me around and like make better decisions in my life, what else could it do? And right. I, so that second experience, you know, I found myself, uh, I quit my job after that. I went into working for myself then. And I was like, whoa, like this can really do a lot. Um, so obviously you've done a bit of that. You, you already were working for yourself as a cannabis grower, but uh, Psychonaut Academy. So uh, the word academy kind of implies some teaching. Um, yeah. 
So yes. what, what what is it Psychonaut Academy teaches? So, um, well, about Envilgens, um, I try to, well, first of all, as I said, we're a village. So one thing about Psychonaut Academy Detroit, it's almost always open. Uh, so we, me and my family, because I run the Psychonaut Academy with my queen, Ifeche, and um, so we have our own home that we open up to the academy, but we also have a medicine house. So even if we're at home and we don't feel like being bothered, the medicine house is here and the village can come and they can go through the mushroom trips. They can use the rape, they can do sananga, you know, so I have all of these things. So, but um, outside of that, usually I am here. And so we educate, we don't just utilize, actually we do more talks and education than we do more actual medicine work, okay? So we have classes, we have courses, um, we have people who will just be interested and they'll come into town, they'll stay today the at the Psychonaut House and ask questions and read books and we'll you know, go through teachings and show them things. Um, and also we do medicine work. Uh, as you said earlier, this weekend we are hosting a uh, ayahuasca retreat here in Detroit. So we are introducing a lot of people to the ayahuasca uh, where they don't have to travel to the Amazon or Peru or anything like that, which I'm not knocking that because if you can get there, then by all means, go there and get it where it comes from. I always say that. However, there's some people who need this healing. They need these entheogenic truths, as you said, to get in touch with what they need inside of themselves. We don't heal people. We show people the route that they need to take to go to heal themselves, to find the healing that they look for. So, um, but to answer your question, yes, we do have classes on spiritual things, on ancestral realms, on magic, on metaphysics, on health and nutrition, on uh, mystic arts, sorcery. We're, we, you know, all type of entheogenic walks. We try to, if not just introduce you, uh, give you the education that you need to actually be able to have these experiences and utilize these these situations safely. Um, if you don't have access to do these things at your home, we have rooms in the medicine house to where you can come and go for your mushroom trip high dose overnight, or you can experience, you know, the freedom of the LSD, or, you know, you might want to try out the boo photo, you know, so we have all of these things, but First and foremost, we need you to be educated. We, you know, as they say, the best, uh, the, what is that? The best consumer is an educated consumer. 100%. Um, so I, I I know and respect your work in mycology. Uh, I, I've seen some of the work you've done there coming to this as a mycologist. Uh, that's uh, really where my heart is. But I'm also, you know, a cannabis grower. And the work we've been doing with Decrim Nature Michigan is to allow a grow gather gift model. It's not so much, you know, we recognize these things, it is inevitable that the medicalization, the commodification, all of these things are going to happen, whether we want it or whether we don't. But in the meantime, like you said, not everybody can get to the Amazon. There's an accessibility issue with these substances as soon as we commodify them, even here locally. Um, so uh, I know, uh, I, at least I'm pretty sure you teach mycology classes and uh, some cultivation classes, but some I found myself really exploring lately since we had our big win in Ann Arbor is exploration of growing other entheogens. Um, have you... Do you have uh, any experience outside of the cannabis mushroom uh, realm it, with uh, entheogen cultivation? Um, not currently. However, I have been speaking about, because you know, it's a lot of people going, because uh, I also have Go Green Installations, which is a grow room installation company. So I'm seeing that a lot of people now are starting to try to in, uh, install cannabis gardens. And I'm like, man, do they realize the things that they could grow? They can grow ginseng in Michigan, which is a cash crop. Uh, you can grow false unicorn root indoors. You can grow. So I've been plotting in my mind 
that garden, but I have not actually planted any other entheogenics. Well, actually, I apologize. I do have uh, San Pedro cactuses, so I am growing those. Uh, San Pedro is, uh, you know, we, we started the pe the peyote discussion earlier. Yes, uh, yes. The conservation of peyote. But just because it's endangered doesn't mean the mescaline cacti experience is not available to everybody. San Pedro, Peruvian torch, Bolivian torch are all really fantastic options. Uh, but one yeah. of the, yeah, go, go for it. I don't mean to cut your wisdom. I'm, I would assume that you might've touched on this once in your show, but maybe not. Are you familiar with the, um, not splicing, but the, the, what is the, it's the correct word, but uh, grafting yeah. of the San Pedro onto the, um, pay, or excuse me, the peyote onto the San Pedro to increase the growth rate. Yeah, so I, I actually am quite familiar with that. It works really well. Uh, yeah, I, my, my, I've heard a lot of concerns about actually it increases water weight faster than it increases alkaloids. Um, but I've heard that mostly about grafting to non-psychoactives such as a periscopsis, uh, which is a really small but super fast growing. If you graft to San Pedro, it maybe doubles your growth rate. But if you graft to Periscopsis, you can get to full size in like two, three years. Uh, like lots of people were chasing that. And then getting all this bunk peyote, essentially. And it, like, it, it's not bunk. It's definitely got masculine in it. But uh, I definitely think knowing what your grafting stock is is really important. Um but I, I'd love to have a cultivation conversation with you aside from this. Yeah, anyway. my bad even, you know, go to the left. It was just, I was interested no, in that. I'm, I'm, I'm way into cultivation conversations. Um, our listener base has a lot of questions about how to cultivate, especially in the Ann Arbor area where it is now decriminalized to cultivate these substances. People are reaching out every day. Where do I get mushrooms? Will you grow them? Well, how do I grow them? Contact pad. <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, we, uh, I, so there's the Decrim Nature Detroit movement. Um, are you involved at all with them? Um, I have reached out, but have not actually officially um, worked yet. Uh, I actually became familiar during the psychedelic conference that uh, um, the ease uh, in love of Baba Kalinda in memory through, um, and that's when I came became aware of them and the work they were doing. And so I, I reached. It might have been you. I reached out. I know I reached out to a couple people saying, "Hey, I, I probably need to be linked with you all, be it that I'm in Detroit and we're dealing with the same things, like you know, because this this community is a family. So and knowing you're doing the work, hey, if you need us." You know, but I haven't actually done any actual work with them yet. No, I have not. Yeah, well, need, I know, like... To reach out to me, though. I'm here. Yeah, well, I know... Uh, well, Mama Ayana, she's got a lot on her plate always. Uh, she, she's a busy woman, as is. She's got her own life, and politics is definitely not her game. Right. Um, she, she's a great advisor spiritually and in the work we do, but the the politics, she's just not that familiar with it. And then Acacia, uh, Acacia and Tim, I believe just recently have relocated to Mexico. Am I correct with that? Yes. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe you could be the key to reigniting that movement in Detroit. Um, I, I, I think uh, Detroit, uh, like Colin said, Hazel Park, Madison Heights, uh, it's little suburbs of Detroit are doing it, but Detroit has existing one of the largest psychedelic communities and largest, r r longest running large psychedelic communities there is, whereas everywhere else, we've just kind of piecemealed ourselves together. Um, 
So uh, I I think that's definitely something we could uh, continue a conversation with moving forward. Um, yeah. I'm I'm asking a lot of questions here though. Uh, I, I'm just really excited. I'm honored. I'm so you say, all right, time's up. We're moving to the next thing. I'm here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I'm really excited to have these conversations, but we're already connected. I want to give Colin and Jim a chance to jump in here uh, for sure. Sorry, I was just listening. You know, I just let you go. I'm not going to get in the way. Like, I'm not going to put the brakes on you. Um. I was gonna say, uh, like, uh, with the decrim nature of Detroit, um, also, uh, uh Baba Moody, uh, is Moody is, uh, he's, he's in, involved with that too. So if you could get with him, um, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, I know, um, I have a, my Senator, um, I'm from Dearborn. And so my Senator, her district is, uh, in Detroit. And I recently talked to her office and, um, her chief of staff uh, recommended a city council person we go after in the city of Detroit. So I'm hoping like hopefully work with uh, Detroit DN and we can do something in the near future. Awesome. Um, yeah. Definitely. But I guess uh, like um, how did, uh, how long ago has like the Detroit Psychedelic Academy been like going on? I know at least like since I don't know. Uh, Psychonaut Academy, Psych 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 Academy of Detroit. Yeah, I keep saying it wrong, and I okay. I said okay. I'm saying everything wrong today. So hey, that's what we do. <laughs> we we know what you meant. Um, we've been operating as an organization almost two years now, almost two years as a public organization. Once we got uh, Native American Church of Turtle Island protection. Uh, it, uh, before that, it was more underground. Um, at one point in time, I was polygynous and I had multiple wives. So I actually was doing a lot of the medicine work in the private of my home with myself, my wives, their family, their sisters and brothers. So it was, I was, you know, more or less dealing with working with people, but on a private, you know, um, term, just learning the medicine more and more uh going in on deeper trips myself and then taking other people in going myself you know just really learning it um and it wasn't until i actually was comfortable offering our services to the public until about two years ago you know i just felt like you know the protection really made me feel more because you know with the decriminalization decriminalization of cannabis that's kind of how I, when coming out the military, made my money. And so I already was kind of proud of going from, quote, unquote, the street hustle to I'm legal. You know what I mean? I'm legal, 100% everything that I'm doing. So once I started dealing with the mushrooms and sacred plant medicines, it was like, oh, here I go again. You know, so once I got the protection to operate as a Native American church, and this was our religious rights, then I was like, okay, now I'm comfortable. Cool. Do you, uh, Ace and Sarah Seven, I'm Jim. Good to see you, man. It's really great to have you on the show. Peace, um, honor. Thank you. Yeah, you, uh, what, um, gosh, I just lost my train of thought welcoming you on the show. Um, well, here's something. How, how would somebody get involved with the Psychonautic Academy of Detroit if we want to, if we wanted to join? Right. Okay. So I always like to say, is that something you join? It's a village. And so if you show up and your heart is pure and you don't have no malice towards anybody in here, then you're gonna come in and you're gonna join your village. And if you're if, if we're sitting around and we're talking and you know um, eating good food, I mean we really come together as a village and you say, Hey, I've been wanting to learn about this, then we're all gonna go, oh, and then for the next two days, we're going to be talking about that. And we might go into experiencing that and open it up. Because, you know, a lot of times people just want the education. It's not like, well, I wasn't saying I wanted to try it. I just want. So we really, you know, go in through the education. You know, we will teach you about it. We'll show it to you. We'll have people around who have dealt with it, who's been utilizing it, you know, things of this nature. And if the time feels 
right for you and you know you decide to go through something then because i'm also a cambo practitioner so you know dealing with the healing work you know um so a lot of people come through and get cambo for the first time you know it's kind of like they find that as a comforting um thing to do knowing that they're getting cleansed but also a way to kind of try something out without having to go into the psychedelic realms because to be honest the people who come here and are just like hey you got this i want to do this we kind of sit back like oh well you know hey you know you can grow it or you can do this or you know because we're like we like to tell people we're not um suppliers of anything mm. so if it looks like you're just the type who you've heard about or you've used and you're really just wanting to come and have somebody supply you with something we kind of veer away from that like we're family you ain't even sat down and had no lunch or you know what i'm saying talk to us like why are you asking us about this like can we talk about it you know what i mean and usually they like no i just want to know if you had it and like no you can just no you can keep going you know what i mean that's not how we operate so you more or less just come around literally you come around and you know we 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 just break bread as a family and when you have time you you're here and we address the things that come up you know um outside of what's already uh scheduled so if you come around and we say oh we got this scheduled or we got that then you could just come and learn about it then or whatnot but other than that just as a village just come around and ask does your, does so, your uh, i'm sorry does your academy have no, any um any uh like do you base any of your ceremonies on like shapipo or any other tribes to, uh, that, that um so when i when i initially when i do the cambo it's based off of the masses tribe okay. um technique um acacia that he mentioned earlier she is one of my sacred plant teacher sacred plant medicine teachers mm -hmm. so she is the one who actually taught and initiated me as a cambo practitioner um and so now i'm glad you asked that question I'm glad you asked that question. I want to be clear about this. I pride myself in going to the root. Okay, so let's take something uh, Changa, right? The smokable ayahuasca, as they call it, right? They are, as they call, different formulas out here. And you got you got the lavender in it and the mullein in it. And then I put some of this in it and this magic herb in it. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, that's cool. So what you have is you have a smokable or excuse me, a, a herbally infused with DMT. But to me, it's not Chaga. Because to me, Chaga is smokable ayahuasca. The way it was created, it was created using the actual ingredients that go into ayahuasca. The MAOI that go they put in there, the root, all of that so for me when i'm going to utilize it that's what i call it and so with you saying that anything that i'm dealing with i try to go as deep into the root of where it comes from and how the indigenous did it and how they offered it as i can that to me is the way that you honor the medicines see i work for the medicines the medicines don't work for me so right. Yes, I do try to keep whatever it is that I teach or that I practice or that I offer, I try to keep it as pure to the essence that I got it and that it comes from. It's an honor thing. Beautiful, bro. Beautiful. Um, so we've got, it looks like another two minutes here uh, before we uh, need to move on. But I, I first and foremost, Thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I really do appreciate that. I love hearing you spit your wisdom and, you know, sharing with us. Uh, I, 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 you know, having followed you since uh, Detroit Psychedelic, Acad or, uh, Psychedelic Conference, I, I knew I've known this whole time you need to be on the show and we need to have these conversations and dig a little bit deeper. Um, but I, I know in turn, you speak about, you know, the village and being part of the village to participate because a lot of people are just looking for the substance. But you are the Psycho Academy of Detroit. You do offer classes and courses. If somebody who maybe lives in Ann Arbor 
wants to learn to grow mushrooms and you're offering a mushroom class or wants to just dig in to some of the healing work or the magic or the metaphysics in one of your classes, are those open more to the public? And is there a place people can find that information? Yes, um, we do offer most of the classes and things over Zoom and things of this nature, because we do have a lot of people that's part of the Psychonaut Academy Detroit that are in other, not just cities, but states, Ohio, Indiana, um, and even further out, Pittsburgh, you know, further out. So um, yes, we do. And also we are moving medicine workers. So we actually allow people to set up a workshop in their city and we will actually travel, me and my family, and come and do the medicine works there, take people through their you know, experiences there, things of that nature. But actually, yes. Um, and the way to the best way to contact us is um, through the Facebook page. We have a group, the Psychonaut Academy of Detroit. And what was the website? Um, it has two of them. It's the psychonautagteam.com. The link is on the Psychonaut Academy of Detroit page. Gotcha. Um, if you go to the Facebook, uh, group Psychonaut Academy of Detroit, it has all the links to anywhere else that you would need to. So that's the best way to contact us. But yes, we're not like just, we're not saying you have to come and hang out with us for months for us to, no, it's, it's just more of a, some people will literally call and say, hey, do you got DMT? How much for? And we're going, whoa, whoa, Who's, <laughs> why would you think that? And what, you know what I mean? No, that's, that's what we're saying. Don't, we don't want anything like that. That's if you're looking to actually go into some things of that nature, we need to spend time with you, you know, but mm -hmm. outside of that, the classes, all of these things, yes, they are open to the public. That is, that's what it is like our, our teachings, our classes, our courses, our field trips, our uh, potlucks, our, I mean, we have all types of stuff. So yes, it's definitely all open to the public. It's just when we get into the sacred medicine work, mm -hmm. we do that as a village. You know, I, I can't echo what you just said enough. The number of times people just reach out and they're like, yo, where the DMT at? Where I get these mushrooms? Like, whoa, whoa. Like, you didn't even introduce yourself yet. Like, you think I'm going to just like, yeah, no, 100% heard. Um, thank you so much, Sincere Seven, for being on the Entheo show. Uh, feel free to stick around. Uh during Syed's uh, interview here and the rest of the show. Uh, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to speak up. And uh, I'm gonna be sure to follow up with you because uh, I think we can uh, deepen this cultivation discussion quite a bit. I look forward to it and I leave you all as I always leave my people, tell somebody you love them in the language they can understand it in. I'm honored, thank you. Thank you, bless. Well, uh, welcome to hey, the Syed. show, of Saeed um, Murtaza, Murtaza. Did I say that right? Yeah, Saeed or Syed, depending on where you're from. Uh, I, if you're, I work in Dearborn schools, so I get a lot of like Saeed there, and then uh, with like my family or like people from around here, I get Saeed. So no preference, whichever one works. Gotcha. I'm from Dearborn, so that's where I get that from. I guess. Oh, you, there you, yeah. So there it is. <laughs> where uh, did you go to school in Dearborn? I did. I went to Dearborn High. What middle school did you go to? I went to Sacred Heart. Oh, okay. Because so I work at Bryant. Catholic school. But um, you're a organizer for um, Medicine Heights Mutual Aid too. Yeah. And, so, uh, and, mm -hmm. I was gonna say you're about to organize a DN Medicine Heights chapter. I I heard. So yeah, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah. Uh, Got the opportunity to meet with Jim, which was awesome. Uh, yeah. It was a really, really great meeting that we had. And so uh, we've been reaching out to some people, but essentially with Medicine Science Mutual Aid, that was kind of born out of what most mutual aids are, saw a need in the community and wanted to be able to fill it without relying on money, which essentially is what we need for anything. So get connecting neighbors to get resources to each other. And so we were thinking of how we could really make bigger differences in our community. And um, one of those was a community crisis response team. 
um, so that we could respond to mental health emergencies or um, whatever of the nature. And we kind of got thinking deeper. And I remember reading something about Decrim Michigan and Decrim Ann Arbor. So I started looking into it and I reached out and that's kind of how we got into this path of, it's a holistic view of how we can work with our community and help the community. So this is, this is the path we're on now. Awesome. Um, so I guess, uh, like, um, you yourself, have you like ever, um, like, uh, ex had any experiences or like what led you to like reading about like, uh, psychedelics or entheogens? Yeah. Um, well, so I studied psychology in college and then, um, I've been using cannabis myself and it's become a very essential tool in my process because I've also started going to therapy over the past year and a half and that kind of coincided with me using it and um, I'm fortunate to have therapists that are very open about it as well and it's 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 been very instrumental to me even getting to like this whole mutual aid idea and um, kind of broadening my my views on a lot of things which has been really I, I'm sure you, all of you can relate. It's just like kind of a crazy mental experience being like, wow, like I could, I can contribute so much or like I can do so much than I thought I was limited to. And so I have extremely positive experiences and, and, you know, that's kind of what my peers and what, what I do with work as well is what I'm kind of like sending the message of. Nice. Um, um, I'll go for it, Kyle. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about your the mutual aid or, organizer job. Like, how did uh, you get involved with that? And like, um, what are some other uh, goals that you guys have? Yeah, so uh, it's, I want to say the idea kind of started at the end of the election. Um, just developing as a person, I was started becoming like this this like super statistics, like if I'm having an argument, I'm like, you know, this percentage of that, this percentage of that. And I'm like, after the election and after everything that happened, I was just kind of like, what's the point of really caring about this big picture stuff that it's, I can say whatever I want, it's not gonna affect me. Um, so I wanted to actually make some change that I can actually see happening in front of me. So I thought that the best way would be to get involved with local community. And that's kind of changed my view on that too. I think that's the only way to change things is community by community. And that's kind of what this, that's what I liked about what Jim had said as well, of the, the way that that decrim uh, nature Michigan is running things. So I started mutual aid by myself and I started meeting other local organizers. Madison Heights has a really cool grassroots structure where a lot of things have been popping up. So we have like a food pantry, we have a seed library, um, we have an anti-racist coalition. I mean, we're having a Juneteenth festival next year. So it's really cool to see all these like small things pop up um, and really create more of a community. And with the mutual aid, it started getting bigger. And right now the biggest project we're working on is a community garden, which will be really cool um, to remove access uh, or remove barriers to uh, increase access to fresh vegetables um, and healthy vegetables. Cause I also started reading about how like, you know, farming vegetables in a large scale really removes the amount of nutrients that they also have too. Um, so just looking into like the, the science of growing things as well was really cool. Um, and then the next couple of projects we're working on is a community fridge as well. It'll kind of help facilitate keeping those vegetables and fruits fresh for people who may not have access to a refrigerator or something like that. But we're really open to a lots of projects. We just wanna do what we can with the resources we have. And you started Mutual Aid? I did, yeah. Wow. Uh, I originally started it and then um, we have an awesome team who, uh, whom a couple of you met with. Uh, you met with Sean and Elliot and then we also have Nicole and Pastor Diggs, which has been awesome. He is a pastor at the church that is allowing us to do the community garden. And he's like on board with essentially like helping us get to wherever we need to go. Yeah, he actually helped us become a nonprofit very recently. So we can enjoy the tax benefits of being able to collect money and work on projects. Yeah. That's really cool.
And now Decrim is getting started. So, uh, yeah, uh, you're working on Decrim Madison Heights. Yep. Um, who else? Who else is involved there with so, uh, the Decrim effort? Yeah. So right now, um, honestly, like we just got started like doing this. We met with the gym. I want to say like two weeks ago, and so then we're kind of like setting up meetings. We're kind of partnering with Hazel Park as well, and. The idea might be that we can kind of form a coalition with all the cities. We're all super close, Madison Heights, Royal Oak, Ferndale, Hazel Park. Like all of us kind of, I think, are moving in the same direction as what Ferndale kind of has become. And so hopefully, based on the couple of meetings that are be coming up, we'll have like more of an organization um, going. That's really exciting to hear. Uh, I like the idea of building a coalition for the area. Uh, same thing has actually happened in with the Decrim Nature Mid Michigan group. They're uh, Lansing, East Lansing. They're looking at Mount Pleasant and Battle Creek. Um, Southwest Michigan's doing the same thing. So fully encourage that. That's really exciting. Um, I. You said uh, the pastor you're working with has a community garden. Um, I know uh, it's maybe a little bit of a hard subject to get into entheogens <laughs> and spirituality, but uh, I mean, that's what entheogen means. It's a spirituality thing. Uh, so uh, what, uh, how do you... Uh, how do you bridge that gap there? Are, are you planning on trying to bridge that gap uh, with the local church and the community garden and uh, maybe implement some entheogens for the community there? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I would have to talk to Pastor Diggs about that because I don't know his uh, views or opinions on it, but I do think it's a great idea and hopefully this is one step in that direction. Um, I know definitely he is also wanting to see big change in Madison Heights and um, you know churches are one of the biggest landowners in the country so there's a lot of area to grow a lot of things and it's a spiritual thing as well so they like you said go hand in hand so I think this that what we're doing is starting that conversation about how do we normalize it you know like for me myself I'm Muslim um, and like in Islam, a lot of things are uh, based on interpretation. So like you have Sufism, which is a sect of Islam, and like you see that there's like hashish use historically. Um, and I know for most Eastern cultures as well, that's like something that's been a core part and existed before even Islam existed, you know? So I think there's definitely a lot of room to explore. And that's, that's one thing that I'm also trying to push definitely as well within within uh, being Muslim. I, the, the only reason I ask is I have found uh, in several cases, community spiritual leaders can be some of the best allies for this movement. And it's, it's just very difficult to open that conversation sometimes because, you know, it sounds like we're saying drugs. And let's be clear, we've talked about it in the past on the show, all drugs should be decriminalized and nobody should be thrown in jail for what they consciously choose to consume in their body for any sort of, you know, enhancement or effect to themselves. Um, but psychedelics specifically have this a very strong spiritual aspect. Um, there's a book uh, edited by Robert Forte, uh, say Entheogens and the Future of Religion. And in it, he not only talks to leading psychedelic experts, but he's talking to leaders in the Islam community. Uh, he's talking to a Benedictine monk, talking to ordained ministers, talking to a Quaker, um, and really like bridging the gap Monk spiritual practices and showing that we're all trying to do the same thing here. Um, so I think that's really exciting uh, that that is a possibility there. Uh, 
And I, I, I love to see how this progresses. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, I don't really have a question here, but I keep, I keep glancing at your shirt. Don't panic. Uh, hit it. Oh, I, that's even better. We just made shirts for our mutual aid organization. It's going to be, it's just directly funded towards projects. So it's don't panic, organize. Oh, yeah. And then the back is Madison Heights mutual aid. I, I love that because keeping up, keeping up uh, stepping up for our community. That's what it says. Nice, man. For me, that's what the psychedelic uh, entheogenic movement is all about. It, oh, yeah. It's I'm about, what was that, Jeff? I'm a, Jim? I'm a medium. You're a medium? All right. All right. <laughs> Perfect. I'll keep that in mind. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, I, I really appreciate that. For me, this is really about reaching communities that are struggling, that are being marginalized and stigmatized for whether it be their use or, you know, the color of their skin or their geographic placement or whatever. Um, the, the entheogenic movement really just seems to like wipe that all away for me. And like, really, it, that those are the people that can be helped the most. If you are being marginalized, if you are in a tough spot without access to resources, food, garden, it, the entheogenic movement is really building those sorts of communities. And so to see, you know, this kind of bridge between a decrim nature movement in Michigan and a local mutual aid nonprofit. Uh, I've worked in the nonprofit sector most of my adult life. Um, so I, it's very really exciting to hear the work you're doing. Uh, but I'm also a big Douglas Adams fan. So I saw the don't panic and I was like, right on. And then you pulled it up and it said, organize. And my heart just melted. So, uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll gladly buy a shirt and I am on the wrong side of the state for that. But uh, I, I will totally rock that shirt. No, mutual aid could be anywhere, right? So it's, it's for sure. Yeah. And like I said, the money will be going directly towards projects. Uh, I know we have like a nonprofit structure and there's a lot that goes along with that. But uh, all the funding we get doesn't go towards operation costs or anything like that. Just direct action projects. So one of the big things we talk about in Decrim Nature is we're doing this for accessibility. We've talked about it already on this episode. Um, entheogens are inevitably about to be medicalized and ultimately commodified, which is going to create a lack of access for the people that need it most. And, uh, you know, it's, Accessibility doesn't even start at entheogens or end at entheogens. It, it is so much more. Um, but what are your thoughts on best ways? Because not everybody can even grow mushrooms or grow their own entheogens. As much as this is about accessibility in terms of like, hey, everybody should be able to do this in their home. Some people don't even have a home to do this or a space to do this. What are your thoughts on best approaches to accessibility of entheogens for people that won't have the ability to grow? Um, I mean, DN's based on a grow gather gift model. So you can grow, you can gather together and you can gather from the wild and you can gift each other in community ceremony and amongst friends. But uh what are your thoughts as somebody who works really in those sorts of accessibility spheres of, you know, getting entheogens to the people? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a complicated question because we have so many systems working against us because like even if when it inevitably does become legal, then there's so many other barriers because then like my issue also is like, with marijuana, there's an age limit on it. There are kids that need marijuana to stop their seizures. Like there are, like you were saying, accessibility issues in every single factor. So I think that we'll have to work hard to change the stigma of what it is, which is what we're doing. 
Um, I think we'll have to work with, like you were saying, like local organizations, like churches, to really change it, to make it make it what it is, back to what it was, a spiritual uh, guide. And I think that we need to normalize the idea that things should be free. So um, sharing whatever we have, that's the mutual aid side of it. And it's medic medication, it's spiritual guides. So I don't see why someone who has the accessibility to grow or to harvest or to buy certain products or uh, plants or whatnot should not be able to share it with, with their community for free. Um, and also have locations like churches where they can go on these journeys. In fact, I actually have a friend who is in the process of opening up a uh, mental health practice that does uh, pre pre um, journey sessions and then post as well. So they help kind of like prepare you mentally and then like kind of go over whatever, you know, I know a lot of people like to use it to help with trauma. So uh, that's a really great way to be guided through that kind of journey. Uh, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because so often we talk about uh, the integration piece. You've had this journey. How do I integrate that into my everyday life? These experiencing, these eye-opening uh, experiences that you had. How do you integrate this? But we very rarely bring up preparation. And preparation is equally important. And I'm really glad you bring that up. Um, again, that's not a question. Just, you know, a little bit of feedback. You know, I'm uh, just thinking. It's like but. personal experience, too. I mean, I remember the first couple times I got high. I think the second time I did, I had a panic attack. And I mean, I think we've all probably had one once and it's like, it's really like once you have one, it's, you know, you kind of understand how it works in your brain. I don't know how, how you guys like cognitively map stuff out, but like, I know like what happens. So I know what I can do to kind of mentally avoid it. Um, but I think the, the, the mental health aspect of it, cause I also do work at a psych practice, um, part-time and, um, I, I just think that the limits for what, what we can do is, is there's no way to end, end where we can, we can really open up with this. I mean, I think that it could also help with like the political environment we're in right now, you know? Um, like I said, the, using marijuana was key to my like political journey, my spiritual journey. Like, I, I really do think that it was very instrumental in helping me broaden my worldwide view. So I, like it's a core, I think it's just that there's so many things that revolve around it that we need to work on, um, much like everything else that's a social issue in our life currently. It's kind of quiet. All right. Um, I appreciate. I was gonna I, sneeze I there. For the second. I, I didn't mean to get deep. I just no, that's what, no. that's what I think about it because it's always so more so much more complicated in my head than when I think about it because it's not a single issue, like a single issue thing. It, it's it's really not. Um, and I, you know, so often in this show, it's very easy for us to get caught up on these single issue things, you know, and recognizing exactly what psychedelics and entheogens have taught us that this is, this needs to be a holistic practice. This needs to include every little factor. It's not just, you know, the preparation. It's not just the integration. It's not just you know, it, it, even the preparation, it's not just mental preparation, it's your space. It's, uh, you know, the people you're surrounding yourself with. Everything plays into everything else. And I, I'm really glad you said, uh, you know, th this could really change the political climate. I've been a firm believer of that a long time. And one of the biggest this is a pushback I get as somebody who is mostly left-leaning. I'm a little bit all over the political spectrum, but uh, as somebody who's 
very often left leaning. As soon as I say psychedelics could change the political spectrum, they're like, I don't want to give some mushrooms to somebody that loves Trump. What the hell would they do? And like, I, I know several people on the right that are better people because of their psychedelic experience. Um, it's, I don't think it's going to make a bad person worse. I, I truly don't believe that. Now, if you're predisposed to maybe schizophrenia, or mm. certainly you could exacerbate that issue. But as long as you take the time, say you're going to do it in your space, like your indoor space that you chill in, making sure that you go through before the experience and tidy things up. Don't have it be a clusterfuck of everything that's going on in your life. You know, a little bit of your work over here, some notes of things to do, you know, all these things are going to start stressing you out. Put that away. Put the books back on the shelf that, you know, you've been pulling out lately. Take the box of, you know, Cheez-Its or the bag of chips or, you know, those three empty bottles of wine sitting on table. Get rid of them. Don't have a mess. Um, one of the things I find very useful when I do reach that sort of panic attack state is in the moment, a harsh shift in environment. If I'm indoors and I start to panic, I go outdoors. If it's dark and I start to panic, I turn on a light. If it's bright and I start to panic, I go into a dark space and I close my eyes. It's legitimately recognizing that the challenge that you're facing in that moment is entirely up here, that you are creating its importance and its intensity. And it, it really is as simple as just like changing your environment in that moment. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I really, I'm glad you're on the show because uh, we don't talk about mixing at the agendas and politics enough. Uh, we talk about the political work that needs to be done to decriminalize these things, but we don't talk about how much the dissonance between parties, between, you know, pro-life and pro-choice or whatever, you know, different ends of the issue. It's attack, 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 attack from both sides. And I, I really don't care how you identify. That's, that's what happens in politics. And psychedelics help you find a new perspective that isn't inside yourself, but is more, you know, I, somebody else's perspective and help you bridge that gap so you can have that conversation with, with what has seemed the enemy when quite yeah, frankly so i can add on to yeah. that too in 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 addition to show, changing your perspective on other people's you know uh lives and and so you can see their their side it also shows you like how to love yourself it shows you uh, a little bit more about yeah. how you can accept yourself for things that you might not accept and it's it, it's remarkable in that way because that that then feeds into you accepting others and it's just perpetual yeah i feel like uh like what you were getting at also like with how we compartmentalize everything it's just we're whole and we need to see that you know see other people's perspectives and and uh, yeah it's just such an interesting way to think about things uh didn't mean to bring up politics but i mean i think everything is politics right so uh it's definitely something that i think is a useful tool entheogens are the future um i think plants are the future in general i mean look at the work that's being done with seaweed and algae like i think that's the future of 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 uh farming right there so i think uh, yeah i mean i think everything nature is just the key to you know to be cliche restoring balance in nature it's funny because we just had the conversation about I'm going to Mars, <laughs> which is about the exact opposite. But uh, no, it, it is about it, it. Nature has helped me learn about balance, has helped me learn you can have progress as long as you, you know, 
have balance. Um, and that's one of the things we don't have in a lot of progress that we have is we just push forward and we for it's all in. We take all of our chips and we toss them in the center of the table and let the dice roll. And no, you, you've got to balance this out. You can't go all in. You've got to stick to your roots uh, as you move forward. You've got to go back to your nature. Something you said, uh, Jim, about loving yourself. Uh, I, I'm very glad you brought that up because I just had a very great conversation with one, one of my roommates yesterday. And hopefully you can still hear me because I look like I'm breaking up. Yeah, we can. Okay, good. Good. Um, <laughs> uh, my internet's so bad today. Um, but, well, you know, because of how tense political and social climates have gotten in recent times, people tend to tiptoe. People tend to mask themselves a little bit. And I don't mean, you know, throwing their face mask on. I mean, they tend to mask who they are to not upset anybody, to not draw attention from somebody that does agree or disagree with them and to not to just have a really calm peaceful sort of whatever but that is not true to oneself and it's if you're totally true to yourself it's very easy to be extraordinarily flamboyant you know i'm i'm a bright guy i'm really like electric yellow glasses and stuff so like i'm really in your face and that's a little upsetting to people too and finding the balance in you know respecting other people's space while still being true to yourself and loving yourself doesn't happen without first loving yourself you have to know who you are at your core and go back to that root back to that nature so um i, I mean that's an opinion that's a that's not a fact uh i can't prove it uh that's just how i feel <laughs> good i mean i think that like you know that's why i think mental health and antiogens are so intertwined and should be intertwined is because you have this great tool, but what if you get someone to help you use this tool? You know, I think that's like the ultimate, ultimate thing. And I think that's that the spiritual portion of it. And Jim, when you brought that up in our meeting of, of the, that you had wished that more of the key push was towards people of color and indigenous people that really got me thinking. And we have, you know, we all have connections. We know people. And I, I was able to reach out to some uh, one of my really good friends who is indigenous and involved in that community. And I think, you know, that's, that's kind of going to be that core direction that we want to push for the Madison Heights portion of, of, of decrim nature. So I, yeah, that, that really stuck with me and, you know, being a person of color as well, I, I was thinking about it too, after you said, it, and I was like, huh, like, that's a really good point. More of that, more of that. please. Uh, uh, my 100% more of that, you know, I, I feel that a lot being a cishet white male. Um, I, I'm in such a position of privilege all the time that it's really easy to just not understand uh, where other people are coming from. And, you know, when somebody gets upset with me about it, I work really hard to be conscious to recognize that anger is actually quite justified. Um, I, I, I think there's a better way than to scream and shout and, you know, get in your face about it. But uh, I, for years, people that look like me have been impressing people that don't look like me. And so I've never been fair to them. So why should I expect to be treated fairly in return? And it, 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 that's something I've been working on a lot lately, but we are three white hosts, three white male hosts on a show. And that is something that's always bothered me about the work we do is it's not so much that people of color and indigenous folks don't care or don't want to be involved. 
they just have more of a target, at least in my understanding, on their back. And they're not in the position to just jump out and say it. And I, I really hope those things are changing. Um, you're cutting out now. Give me a, you're, we can't hear you. You, you went out? Is that it? <laughs> well, uh, I, th I mean, I think that the work that, that we're doing with your criminal nature is really important. And the, the fact that like, you know, what you're saying and Jim, what you had mentioned, the fact that you're even in tune to that and aware of, of the, the issues is speaks, you know, and I think we're all developing people and we're all becoming aware of the world around us. So uh, whatever your identity is, I don't think it should matter as long as you're aware that other people have different identities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself because you know, you don't have to speak or represent everyone because you're you and you're awesome. And I appreciate you for your thoughts and what you had said. Um, and like, that's a good point that you made too. Cause like myself, uh, I had actually just wrote something about it this week, but like Eid was yesterday. And that's one of like the most religious holidays for Muslims. And I'm also a Muslim that doesn't necessarily I don't practice. That's the first time I've said it publicly right now, actually. Um, but it's been something that I've been more open with and using marijuana as a Muslim too is one of those like iffy things because things are haram, which is like, you know, a, a sin to do or halal, they're okay. Um, so it's interesting, but like, I don't think that should limit the fact that I had such an amazing experience and become a better person because of that. And, and, you know, I think we're learning historically with, with a lot of perceptions in religion, they're just perceptions, not actually what the religion was boiled down to be. And that's a whole different topic too. But um, I think that people of color do have a difficult time um, speaking about these kind of topics and like getting the opportunity to, and you're being able to facilitate it. So I think that's great. And I appreciate you being able to facilitate this kind of conversation. Mike, are you still uh, muted? I've never been muted, but uh, okay, you're good. I don't think you can hear me. We no, can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me again. Sweet. Um, well, I do think we're rounding down on time here. Uh, we've got three minutes left on the show. It's okay. We go a couple minutes over. That's never stopped us. But uh, before we do end, I want to make sure people in Madison Heights know how to reach you, uh, whether it be to uh, help with Madison Heights Mutual Aid or whether it be to, you know, access your services because they're in need. I, I have a hard time imagining many people that need access to services also have access to our show and are listening. But what do I know? I, I I don't know. I'm not in that position. So um, how do people get a hold of you in terms of Madison Heights Mutual Aid, uh, the decrim efforts there? Um, yeah, shout out all your socials and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so currently we're on Facebook. You can look us up, Madison Heights Mutual Aid. Um, we also have Instagram and on the Facebook, you can find the links out to everything else. So like we have a live Google sheet where you can put offers, asks, um, just based on, you know, what services, goods, monetary, whatever you have to offer, whatever you need, it's open to everyone, no matter how much or how little you make, um, accessibility is something we're working on. We recognize that like Facebook and Google sheets is not the only place that people will be able to access that kind of information. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to hopefully be able to do a door to door kind of canvas between Madison Heights. It's not that big of a city, but it is still pretty big and it's getting nice out. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to reach out to some of the people, like you said, um, will not be able to access us on social media, but all our links are on there and, uh, including the shirt link, shout out to that. Um, so make sure you check it out. Thanks for having me guys. Great having Thank you, you Great. so much for being on. I appreciate all your insight. Um, with that, I think uh, we're pretty much at time. So uh, do we know who's on next week? Uh, in two weeks from now, we don't. Uh, It'll weeks? be a surprise. I love surprises. Yes. Like, I don't get them for my birthday and Christmas anymore. So uh, 
<laughs> Might as well have them for the show. Every two weeks instead of twice a year. I love that. Um, so, yeah, we'll see you all in two weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more really fantastic guests. Uh, thank you again. Uh, they're no longer here. But uh, Sincere Seven and Saeed, I don't have last name with me. Murtaza. Murtaza. All right. Thank you again, Saeed Murtaza, a Sincere Seven, for coming on today. Thank you to all of our listeners. We're working hard to improve our format. So we are not just on Facebook. We are going on uh, YouTube after Facebook. We are going on to Instagram, split up into some smaller videos. But hopefully soon, we're going to have some better streaming software and uh, really clean this up a little bit and keep improving the show, keep having amazing guests and uh, moving forward on the conversation. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Colin. Any last words? That's all I got. That's all I got. Just check out that uh, clubhouse meeting coming up and um, the community meeting later in the month. Yeah. Representatives and let them know that you – back uh, statewide decriminalization for entheogen plants and fungi. If you're uncomfortable doing so, contact Decrim Nature Michigan for a easy guide on how to do that with little impact on you. You know, we've got pre-made templates and all that. So uh, thanks a lot. See you next two weeks. Yeah. Peace. Bye.